Today we have an original PS2, and it's given us a bit of a headache. We just want to play some games, but when we plug everything in and turn it on, this happens. The sound is working normally, however the video output has this glitchy appearance to it, which is obviously not playable. I tried jiggling the AV cable and swapping it out, but still got the same result. So we'll have to take this one apart if we want to fix it. I'll quickly point out the model number on this unit is 39001. To get inside, there are these square caps covering the screw heads that we can remove with a dental tool. The previous owner was kind enough to have already removed that one in the upper right corner, but not kind enough to include it with the console. So it is gone forever. Now we can remove these eight Phillips screws and make a note to ourselves that the four on the left side are shorter than the others so that we don't place them incorrectly later. I was surprised to see this console has not been opened before because this sticker is still intact. You can just cut through it with a knife, but we'll try and preserve it a little better by softening the adhesive with alcohol to remove it. Then place it on some wax paper for now and set it aside. I'd recommend doing this before taking the screws out as you could see the shell halves were kind of popping out on me there. Anywho, now we can tilt the top shelf forward a bit and lift up to remove it. There's a flex cable for the power button that we need to be mindful of. We can peel the tape here and set the top shell down. Then we can carefully snap out the button module and set the shell half aside for now. For our purposes, we can largely ignore the disk drive, but there are four screws on the power supply side that we need to remove to free up the circuit boards. Now we can loosely reattach the top shell just to prevent things from spilling out because we need to flip this over, and then remove the bottom shell. There are four screws to remove for the power supply. Then we can pull on the upper left region to remove the board connector. It's on the underside, so not visible in this camera shot. And then on the right side, there's a cable with a latch that we can squeeze and then wiggle out the connector. The power supply is free now, so we can just lift it out. There's a plastic isolating film we can remove as well. This metal shield now should just lift away, and the expansion slot cover fell off, which is fine. We could have removed this at the very beginning, so we'll just set it aside. There are nine small Phillips screws to remove now. They're all the same except the two in the top center region, which are more of a brass color instead of nickel, so we'll note that for later. The metal shield is now free, but this cable for the fan will get in your way, so let's pull the tape on that and unplug it. Oops, unfortunately I see the back end of a screw here still holding the metal shield down, so I must have missed one on the other side. If I flip it back over and check under the fan module, yep, there it is. After removing that, we can flip things over again and keep moving. Removing the shield can be a little finicky, but there is one clip on the front edge here, and two more clips on the back left edge. Even when these clips are undone, it still takes some wiggling to finesse it out, but eventually we get there. With the board revealed, there are six cables to remove, and the last two I'm showing have latches, which we need to flip up before pulling the cables. Now we can remove the board completely and get into more detail on what the graphics issue here might be. The PCB model that we have is GH017, and I was shocked to see that when I looked up a schematic for it that I actually found it. I guess I'm too used to working on Nintendo stuff where this type of specific information is usually just never available. Let's quick touch on a few things here before we get back to the real circuit board. So if we start by focusing on the block diagram, there are two components of interest here, what Sony calls the Emotion Engine, IC104, uh, and this graphic synthesizer, IC202. I believe these are individual components that are part of the larger graphics processing unit, and from research online I've heard that stuff happening between them can go bad. On this sheet, we can see a few connections of interest between IC104 and IC202. There are all these resistor arrays here. So we have starting with RB107 and down to RB124. So any one of these parts could be bad and causing our problem. We can see where these are physically located by going to our board. Where we left off on was the B side of our PCB. And we can zoom in and see some of those resistor arrays right here. If we go to the A side, IC104 and IC202. And now in here, there are more resistor arrays. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll start by looking at the resistor arrays on side B, and we'll see what we can find there. Just for fun, I've overlaid the diagram of the board to transition that schematic stuff into reality. These are the resistors that we're going to test. Each pair of pads should register at 47 ohms, and I'm testing at the board vias instead of the chip itself, which double checks that the soldered connections are also good. This definitely takes some time and patience to go through all of them, but eventually I find something odd at the top two legs of this resistor, which is RB107 per the schematic. Both lines are reading almost 1 mega ohm, so I decide to add some flux and reflow those solder joints, 
clean them off, and test again. Now the reading normal at 47 ohms each, so let's run a quick console test and see if we have any luck. Sadly, it's still a failure, but it's interesting that the glitchy behavior is slightly different than it was before. So now I want to check the resistors on the other side of the board, which is called the A side in the schematic. I go through the same process again of measuring each line until I eventually run into another problem on resistor RB121. The light reflection on my meter here is unfortunate, but that bottom line is reading 4.8 mega ohm. And again, it should be 47 ohms. So it's way too high. I'm going to test whether this line is the main problem by jumpering it with a small wire. I add some extra solder to the legs of the chip and start with a long wire to make the two connections. And then I trim it down to size. And unfortunately, my microscope was not recording during this process, but this is what it looked like after I was finished. Does it look a little janky? Maybe. But let's see how it performs. No way. It looks like we have things working now, which is great to see. It's amazing how one tiny fault on a passive component can ruin an entire PS2. Now I do want to wrap up this video, so I'm just putting things back together as is for now, but I'll point out the proper long-term solution is to replace the damaged resistor array. Luckily, these parts are readily available through various distributors online. At the end of it all, we get lucky in that the console is capable of reading discs, which was an unknown at the start since, you know, we couldn't see the video. We are now in full business with this PS2, and that means it's time to play some Tetris. Sadly, I'm no good at it, but the point is to help you out if you were facing a similar issue with your PS2. So in that spirit, I sincerely hope it was useful, and I will see you in the next video.